Af Africa and Europe, um, as renowned as the founder of the Black Arts Movement in Harlem in the 60s, that became, though short-lived, the virtual blueprint for a new American theater aesthetics. Um, the brother does theater, the brother does stuff around music, the brother does poetry, and the brother has been holding it down in the struggle for decades. Please give it up for our guest tonight. We are honored to have, with the African American Studies Department and Poetry for the People, Amiri Baraka. something and I think for you all in this college seeing the most important thing you could do is find out your own treasure chest amidst all the other stuff that you're going to be have pushed on you mashed on you find your own treasure chest find out the people who got you here you know and also go back to those people who loved you people who made sure you lived to come to college the people who fed you people who protected you, you know. So that's very important, and it's very important, like in the 60s when we did the Black Horse Movement, I remember 1963, I was living in the village, you know, with all the people you know, the beats and whatnot. And then they killed Malcolm X, you know, 1965. And in 1965, I was down in Greenwich Village on 8th Street, 8th Street Bookstore, having a book party. And a brother ran in, named Leroy McLucas, was a photographer, and he said, they just killed Malcolm. It was a Sunday afternoon. And there we were, you know, it's mostly white people, but who are our friends? But those black people down there, those artists, looked at each other, and we knew we was out of here. We knew that if they was going to make war, they'd kill Kennedy. Which we thought, well, that's the last white man we could talk to, we gone. But when they killed Malcolm, we said, no, we got to get out of here. This is not happening. Art is cool, but we have to fight. If they want to make war on us, we're going to make war back. And so that's what we felt. We got out of there, young people, young men and women. And we went to Harlem. And the black arts, the theme was three things. We wanted an art that was black, form, and content, that reflected our history. People used to come up to me and say, Mr. Jones, you know, that was my name, Leroy. You know, as my wife always told me, your mama named you Leroy a king. You wanted to be a midi. That's only a prince. That means you demoted yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but they used to say, Mr. Jones, I didn't know that you were a Negro when I was writing poetry back then. And I wouldn't know how to handle that. You know, I thought maybe I need to get an enema or something. Something was wrong with me. You, know, you can't tell it from the words that it was black people. No. So we wanted a, an art, a poetry that was Afro-American, that was our life, our culture. But secondly, we wanted an art that would come out of places like this. It would go to the streets. That's why we were uplifted with, when, when rap first came. When you saw little black kids walking down the street, you know, say, it's a jungle out there. You know, I mean, we thought that was, you know, Africa Bombada, Curtis Blow, you know, early public enemy. We thought that was super hip, because that was poetry out there on the street, until the corporations caught, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, in turn, like ice tea from talking about against the cops to made him a cop on television. <laughs> but that's the power that they have, and you should never wait to be discovered. You should always publish your own stuff first, you know, like keep your own little gun in there. No matter you get published by anybody, always keep your own heat, you know, so that no matter squash you, nobody can constipate you, nobody can stop you, nobody can erase you because you've got your own heat. You could pull it out. 
And don't wait. Publish your stuff when you think you're ready. Yeah. Poets come to me, I'm a poet. I said, where's your book? <laughs> it's not idle. Where's your book? Where's your CD? Don't be like poetry in private. People say, well, I'm only writing for my song. Well, don't tell me about it then. <laughs> <laughs> if you're writing for yourself, keep it there. You know what I mean? But the third thing we wanted is we wanted to write revolutionary poetry. We wanted revolutionary art. We wanted art to help liberate the Afro-American people. We was not just writing. We wanted to do what Malcolm was doing, because we were the children of Malcolm X. You know, we wanted poetry that talked about self-determination and self-respect and self-defense. We wanted poetry like Du Bois talked about, true self-consciousness. We wanted poetry that would tell us who we were and tell our people who they were and unite them to struggle. That's what we wanted, clearly. And so when people, like my wife has a poem saying, you know, I want to be a people's poet. That's the only way I can do some real good. That's what we thought. I want to be a people's poet because I want to do some real good. When my play, Dutchman, was done, I went down to the corner and read all these newspapers. You said a lot of newspapers. So I kept reading these newspapers and saying, he's crazy. He hates white people. <laughs> he used bad language. You know, you know, this is 1963. Bad language. Now you can find more bad language now in the news. Yeah. <laughs> but then I saw that they wanted to make me famous from all that bad stuff they were saying. So they're going to make me famous. Let's see that. And so suddenly this terrific sense of responsibility came down. Because I was a wild young boy. Now I'll tell you the truth. When I was in the village, some of my people who were still alive, they were reporting on it. But at that point, this sense of responsibility came down on me. I said, you mean now when they say Leroy Jones, that people will know who that is? That they will know who that is all over the world? And then suddenly, all the things that my people had taught me, not the people, the people that loved you, mm -hmm. all those people who, who kept me from getting killed, who fed me, who had bandaged my knee when I came in, I thought about them and the stories they told me about living in America, black. And I said, well, that's what I'm going to talk about. See, that's what you're going to hear. All the stuff they told me, you're going to hear it forever for me. And that's what you need to be, a voice of the people who have no voice. You know, an arm for people who have no arms. You know what I'm saying? That's what you need to do. If you want to do poetry, be bad. Have them put you down. You know, I read about David Walker. They say David Walker's shit was banned everywhere. You could mention, damn, I wish I could do that. <laughs> I wish I could write something that they would say, you can't read that. And I didn't know I could do that. I did it twice, actually. In 1965, they arrested me, and the main uh, evidence was a poem <laughs> called Black People. And the judge said, this is a prescription for criminal anarchy. <laughs> I said, damn, yeah. <laughs> That's right, Jim. So Judge, you don't think they actually read that poem before they went and set fire to the city, did you? <laughs> and then again in 19, no, that was 2002 when they named me the Poet Laureate of the New Jersey. I was, uh, you know, we live in Newark, high on a hill, we could see New York, we could see the buildings, we could see them on fire. You know, and that scared me to death, I'll tell you the truth. But then listening to Bush that whole month, you know, I began to say, Jesus Christ, this is nuts, this guy is crazy. Because for us, terrorism, that's how we came here. <laughs> the bottom of that boat. Slavery, that was terrorism. The Ku Klux Klan, slavery, segregation, the plantation, that's terrorism. You want to talk about terrorism? And then you want to bring democracy somewhere? Bring it to Newark, bro. Yeah. Well, you know, bring, bring democracy here in the United States. That's what I want to know about. So that got really, you know, like they say, pissed off at that. 
So I wrote this poem, and I sent it all over the world on email. And I got a couple of, you know, uh, people negative, mostly positive. But then the governor, in some fit of craziness, named me the poet laureate of New Jersey. I don't know what was wrong with him. I thought it proved that he didn't read poetry, actually. <laughs> so I told him, I said, you know, this is, this is going to get you in trouble, actually. Not because of that poem, but because I thought, you must still know what you're doing. He said, I can handle it. <laughs> so I read that poem at uh, Somebody Blew Up America. I read it at the Bush, the Dodge Festival in New Jersey. And I read it to about a thousand people. I signed the autographs for about an hour. And my old lady sitting, my wife sitting there writing. And then the last people who come by say, that was a hateful poem. I said, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and two days later, the governor calls me up and says, you've got to apologize and resign. You know, I said, no. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, you know. I said, if you want to put that poem on the wall of the assembly and go down it line by line for all of the assemblymen and the state senators, we can do that. Let's get down. Let's do that. You know, so we don't have to do that. <laughs> so why don't you have to do that? Because we don't have to do that. I said, you can't get away with that. He said, we can do anything we want to. See, that's somebody teaching you something. That's a hard lesson. That's somebody teaching you, really. So we can do anything we want to do. And you can't do nothing about it. You know. So that's the way that went down. The irony, of course, is that the governor himself had to resign a year later <laughs> for, you know, uh, having an adulterous homosexual affair, which I always thought was a phony charge, because if he was for gay rights, he just have said, you know, I'm the governor and I'm gay, so what? What you gonna do? So I figured it was some phony stuff behind that, but that's how he came out. You know, his, his uh, uh, friend, his boyfriend was Israeli national. You know? And so then they start jumping on me. But the point is, what they never understand, and you poets need to understand that, why you gotta have, like Stalin says, one foot on the ground. When they talk bad about me, all I do is go home. And people say, hey man, what's happening? How you doing? I went to Venezuela, they had a billboard with my picture, but they would come to Caracas. I went to Columbia, people would say, hey, a mini, a mini. I don't know the people. Am I my first name? Read that poem, man, in Columbia. Medellin, the dope capital. People read poetry. <laughs> so that's what I want to tell you. Don't ever be afraid. Like the man said, have no fear. Have no fear. And for you, Afro-Americans, the treasure chest that you have is so immense. Check it out. Read it. Those people who created stuff for you, go all the way back. Read Fred Douglas. Read that, that Fourth of July speech. Is there anything greater than that? There's no man under the mantle of heaven that does not understand that slavery is wrong for him. Are we to argue that all men have souls? Is that a fit topic for Democrats? Read Fred, of the great writers of the 19th century, Fred Douglas, along with Melville and Emily Dickinson, but Fred Douglas, who was not just a writer, but was fighting against slavery. He gave that speech, he gave that speech, that Fourth of July speech, while he was an escaped slave. Now check that out. You come up for like a thousand white folks and you escape slaves, they dig this. <laughs> you say there are practices in this republic that would embarrass a nation of savages. Ooh. 1863 tell them that. There's practices that would embarrass a nation of savages. <laughs> so when you want to know when people, why are you political? People are like, why are you political? Should I be less political than Fred Douglas? than Harriet Tubman? You mean I should be not as political as, as Zora Neale Hurston, or Paul Robeson, or Langston Hughes, or Sterling Brown, or James Baldwin? You mean I should abandon my own heritage? These people were going boom, boom, and they was in slavery. 
They was writing when they had black and white signs up on buildings. They was boom, 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 boom. They never gave it up. And nobody ever backed them up. You see? And that's your heritage, and you've got to embrace it. You got to embrace it because it's your only strength. Because the one thing that these your enemies don't understand that as long as you have one foot on the ground, as long as you're relating to your people, you are stronger than them. They cannot crush you. They cannot frighten you. They cannot move you out of the way. Somebody said, you got to decide, what, you crazy? When I go home, my people look at me like I was a chump. What, you did what? <laughs> you did what? See, understand that strength. The strength of the people who survived the slave ship. Understand that. Understand that strength. Understand that strength. The people that survived colonialism. The people that survived lynching. And even though now people think this all over, you see the nooses around here? That's just trying to tell you something. You know, like my boy Tony Medina said, no noose is good news. <laughs> And they're back. So I don't know if they wanted me to read poetry or just talk to you and ask, answer questions, but I'll be glad to do either one, actually. Do you read a poem? How about Who Blew Up America? Poem. Okay, let me read <laughs> a couple of short poems, and then if you got questions. I mean, you know, don't get me started. I just read some. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because I got stuff here. Don't worry about it. <laughs> mucho, mucho. <laughs> so let me read this one thing first called race or class. Race or class is the stymieing contradiction puzzling those who ponder affirmative action. The black middle class, some say, has grown so strong as to make any social remuneration for that often crass, betraying bunch redundant. They have already caught that prize for which millions of bloods gave their lives. And there are white folks poor as dirt who make even some brothers and sisters in the project look like they're doing good. Oh yeah, is our reaction. Water climbing up our nervous traceries. But slavery still make it plain that black you was and black you is, no matter what you gain. So yeah, we must include class consideration so that Colin Powell's boring son do not cop at little Abner Jr.'s expense, right on. But I leave you with this burning fact, which Du Bois was wise enough to state, quote, many have suffered as much as we, but none of them was real estate. So just another man. If you haven't read Du Bois, you really don't need to talk to nobody like you know something. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Seriously. Seriously. The stuff that you need to know, you know, like if you was in a, some school where you really would want it to be knowledgeable about the United States, the first thing you'd read the souls of black folks. What's the first lines in that? How does it feel to be a problem? When I read that, man, I said, oh, oh, I hear you. How does it feel to be a problem? Not a person, but a problem. Check that out. Life beneath the veil, as he says. There are some soldiers who don't even remember why they were soldiers and of what value their soldiering was. There are some soldiers who don't even remember why they were soldiers and of what value their soldiering was amongst the broken heaps of possible USAs predated Americas. This rock and roll makes donations in space with people's heads. There are some soldiers who don't even remember why they were soldiers. And of what value their soldiering was amongst the broken heaps of possible USA's predated Americas. This rock and roll makes donations in space with people's heads hanging through the donut hole. Some of these are soldiers were soldiers, or best remembered as soldiers. Then there's soldiers like me who keep a log of where the waves took us and bring whatever back. Soldiers like us who keep a log of where the waves 
take us and bring whatever back. I am yet a soldier. I am yet a soldier, still soldiering, still studying. I am yet a soldier, still soldiering, still studying, still measure ourselves in the enemy, an old soldier with the clarity of years and blood. And I see all kinds of things and people, and some of them are soldiers. Let me read one more poem, then if you've got questions, I'll be glad to answer them. I've got so much stuff in here. <laughs> this is a poem that I wrote for, this was for the eulogy. I've written so many eulogies. I have a book called Eulogies. So I have to write another one. This was the eulogy for actually some musicians, three musicians, and a poet who all died the same month for John Hicks, for Hilton Ruiz. Mm, so much. For Jackie McLean, for Halim Suleiman, called Play That. Play That, the inner tape, the collapse, a rap, the strain, the hippest train, what name for the hours, hours, the early or late towers, the quest, the undress, all that mess, play that. We ain't where we been or gone or thought we got to then when we were the old men, the dots, the feeler, ugly stealers, the wheelers, upon whom everything bent, what was meant, what we spent to know or knew we didn't know, for whom the swirled was a newspaper, a grapefruit, a spinning tomb of where and whom, for those of us who never missed trying to understand, for those among us who took a stand, who felt they could speak or sing for the land. Man, for anybody who could say night or day, this is the way it was. For those we trust, for those who took a bus, who would open their mouths at the fiends and use profanity at the inanity, insanity would cuss for the whole of us. Whoever never doubted they were real and would take the fall, take the hit, appear surreal, vanish in the clannish discovery of our nut-like loyalties with minuscule royalties, heaped with insults and banality, who would dare to stare at the kings and uglier things and still open our mouths and tell jokes to rouse the sleepers, the next week stronger folks to turn from merely looking or booking and force dumbness on the dumb, ugliness on the ugly, expose the liars, extract their teeth, enlarge our beef, outline the seat, the clay on super punk's feet, those who could die before they cry have their necks stretched with 666 hung on their sandals, accusing them of scandals of which the murderers themselves were the handles, all them we as they can. The babies, their armies and navies, for them was true, before, after, and during pain, criminals reserved for you, for them, the glorious and the grim, who laughed with us and wept the dry dusk of the accused, the dishonestly abused, the secret heroes, the banished, the vanished, the tarnished, the unstoppable screamers. We is under your will as shrill. Wherever they try to take us out, some alley, anonymous circumstance, empty hill, we is the same. What call them, whoever name, brought down by any game or guilty lame, we is all the same. For those who honest claim is life without Satan or the craven without misdirection, the evil escape detection played out for us. For the people who would tell you what was really going down, who would give little ground. For those the beasts would hound. Play that, yeah, play that, that heavy bounce, that switchblade funk, that Lydian pentatonic scale for red and black riders of the apocalypse. Play that, signifying blue memory joint, that history narrating, unequivocating, maroon, Lewis growling, ducasonic hyperbole. Play that, yeah, play that. And bring us from wherever we is and was or went, bring us back. Let it be a band collected from across the world. Let it be so hip, even bad bush could be smoked. The Sharon would drown in the sticks, trying to get out of the way of what it say. Play that, play that, play that, that way. And whatever everything be, just get your notes out free. And on the scale, that tail, play it red, what history said. Wail it black, a rhythm attack. Bring it blue, so most people remember it too. It gotta be hot, who like it or not. And boomer doom blown, that syncopate tone. It gotta be out, it can't be stopped with that. Afro-Latin raggedy tabla moan, that yeah, that the way it was and be, that Asiatic Arab cry, that modal, what it is, God, if you is, that double lightning speak I am, what did I do, answer to anything body's unasked future, question, like a plantation whisper, transformed into Lenin's laughter. 
harmonies like Mao's essays on philosophy, and Du Bois question, how does it feel to be Nicolas Guillen and Amy Césaire? And Langston could say, if Margaret told Zora how Lorraine explained music like Lorca made or Dumas played, like the dues Malcolm paid, all improvisation like an endless symphonic conversation when Langston got hooked up with Beethoven and Sunhouse got the Book of the Seven Seals and the Sunrock Cosmo Dialectic Orchestra got down and then strange marks on the page was what the whole world, the whole sensible world could play. The notes was noise. The notes was noise. It was collective improvise from the scores coming forth in the dawn of what I say, like a human hum where life come from, and we smoked it to the ground, made the world spirit sound, hey now, hey now, went out that doubt, that O'Rooney tune, that universal ensemble sound from the sun to the ground, like the soul was over our head and inside everybody where it gonna be, and we'd say, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, right on, play that, yeah, play that. Mm -hmm. One of my closest friends, actually, <laughs> and uh, I think the great poet that came out of that movement was Pedro Pietri. Mm -hmm. You know, I got a poem for Pedro. Pedro is a great friend of mine, one of the greatest poets of anything. The, the, the horrible thing is that Pedro died of Agent Orange. He was in Vietnam, came back. And 20 years later, killed him. So, I mean, it shows you what that is. But Pedro was the po is the poet. Um, you know, Michael Pinero, people like that. I think that there's still a couple of poets who identify. Uh, and, and the New York uh, poetry thing goes on. You know, they there. I mean, they have a, <laughs> they have a, a Latin music night every Wednesday. I mean, every New York is very strong, very strong. Still goes on. Right now they're doing Ishmael Reed's play. <coughs> I don't know the name of it, but they're doing a play of Ishmael's. And, uh, Miguel, of course, who is the founder, Miguel Alarín, Miguel Loparena, uh, Papaleto, those are the founders, and they, you know, were good poets, strong poets, you know. Uh, Mikey Pinero. Tell you a funny story about Mikey. We gave a, a birthday party for Mikey just before he died. We knew he was sick. So we had him at the house, and at the same time, the wife of <coughs> the then president of Nicaragua, who's now president again, was at our house. And the mayor didn't know that that was, you know, that was Nicaraguan uh, president. His <laughs> wife was there, you know. So we have all the pictures with him. <laughs> And I told him after, you know, that, no, that was there. <laughs> but the kids from our neighborhood, a lot of black and Puerto Rican kids came there because they wanted to see Calderon. You know, they didn't know nothing about Mikey Pinero, the, the, the dramatist, the writer. They, you know, what was his name up? Miami Vice? <laughs> you know, Pinero used to play, the, you know, the Vice Lord. Calderon. So they all went in line up and say, hey, Calderon, what's that? <laughs> and he was dead a couple of months later. But I know that lit him up, that lit his heart up to see the little kids who thought he was some kind of vice lord. Well, he was a vice lord in his own way, I tell you. <laughs> <coughs> but it's still a strong movement. And a lot of uh, young Latino poets Mostly Puerto Rican, but now they've got you know a lot of Dominicans, and, uh, uh, Ecuadorians, uh, Cubans. They've got a big Latino spread, but they've got a big multinational spread. It's a strong movement, and that movement, the Pinero, you know Pinero's poem. Uh, no, Pedro's poem. What was the name of the book? His first book. Puerto Rican Obituary. That book. Yeah, that book. Puerto Rican Obituary. 
That's a bad book. That was the book. That was the book when I first read that. I said, whoa. And then uh, Pinero's book, where he's got the, the gospel. It's in that anthology that Miguel did. The gospel according to San Miguelito. That, that, that's, that's a bad book right there. That's a bad poem. You know? But uh, you have to fight for some kind of recognition.